Hey guys, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Stephanie and today is my day off and it is beautiful outside. So I really want to go just have a chill morning, relaxing morning at my favorite cafe before it gets too busy and start reading The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. So let's go. From the very first page, it is immediately so much fun and so beautifully written. I love, I love Samantha Shannon so much and I just want to keep reading. But it's starting to get really hot. I don't know if you can tell how sweaty I am. So, and I have to do a few errands. So I'm going to run to Chinatown really quickly, get some uh, like sewing supplies stuff. And then I think I'm going to just go home and read this all day because I don't, I can't think about anything else right now. <laughs> Hey guys, so I'm back home and as you probably saw, I went to Chinatown. I grabbed a few little bits and bobs that I needed for a project just to finish it off. But I also made a small fabric purchase um, and I got this fabric that is printed like a map and I just, I love it. I definitely don't need any more fabric, but I'm going to just say that it was prior inspired. That is maybe a bit of a lie, but I think it kind of inspired a bit of a mm, wanderlust in me, a desire for other worlds, other places. I just really love the print. So we'll see what I make out of that. But what I really want to talk about is this book. More specifically, I want to talk about the dragons. I'm about 100 pages in at this point, and I'm just so excited that we've already been able to get like a lot of dragons on the page. Actually, we get our very first glimpse on page like seven or something like that at the end of chapter one. I'm just finding it really interesting how the author has drawn on different traditions around dragons and um, dragon like imagery because I know that they. This is like a retelling, a feminist retelling of St. George and the Dragon. But she uses a lot of terms for like wyvern and worms. Has like a very elaborate lore around how uh, the dragons are related to like other mythical creatures. Type of, if this one type of dragon breeds with like a snake or something like that, then you'll have like a basilisk and then there's like rooster, a cockatrice and all of this. Although now there is one element of these dragons that I find very um, confusing. I'm not sure if it's one particular kind of dragon or if it's all dragons yet, but basically there's one part of the book where she begins to describe a dragon as wingless, but being able to fly using an organ in their head called a crown. Now I cannot stop imagining a helicopter just, and I know that's not what what she's what she's describing at all like but she there's no real physical description of like what this organ is or does or looks like 
apart from that, it makes it fly. And I, once they live for 2000 years, then they grow wings. And I also have questions about that. So if they're not born with wings, how do the wings grow? Are they like little stumps that protrude until they actually are, are like fully grown wings? Or are they like, do they grow? Like, you know how like a plant, like the way a plant grows, like another like piece, like with the, along the vine before separating like does it grow if they're long and skinny and they fly does it grow along their bodies and then separate out what happens i want details i take my dragons very seriously and i need more information but so far i'm really enjoying it the descriptions are so rich and the prose is so beautiful without being really heavy and i mean although the the main driving plot is quite slow it is never boring like she really is emphasizing the individual journey of each character which i'm really enjoying and i don't really there's four different perspectives and i don't really find myself too bored of any of them yet So I am moving, so just kind of ignore anything behind me, like random shit on the table and boxes and stuff. Just pretend it isn't there, just like I am pretending it's not there. So it's been about one week since I last checked in. I am in part two, kind of at the 30% mark maybe. I'm 282 pages in, so a little bit more than 30% is. I had a super busy like last week or so at work. We're wrapping up a project. So I had to put reading on hold. I've hit like a few chapters every night here and there before I fall asleep. This book is following four perspectives. There's Iad, who's kind of like the main character. And I don't know if I'm actually pronouncing any of these names correctly. I'm just kind of making it up as I go along, as usual. Yad is a member of the Priory of the Orange Tree, and she has been sent by the Priory to protect the Queen, uh, Sabran. Then we also have Tane, Tane, I think, I want to call her Tane, but I think it's Tane. Um, and she is like this young woman who has been wanting to be a dragon rider for her whole life. She lives out in the east, uh, where dragons are kind of like revered creatures and like really ingrained into the culture. I kind of thought that we were like going to go to dragon school, but that doesn't seem to be where this book is going. But maybe it's because I grew up reading Aragon that I was sort of keen on reliving that like how to ride your dragon bonding experience. Um, and maybe we'll get some of that still, but I'm almost halfway and it's not yet. We have Nick Lays, who is also in the East, at least when the book starts, and he is sort of an alchemist. He's a doctor and an alchemist who is in exile in the East, and his character is one of my favorites, uh, maybe second to Iad, but he just seems kind of like grumpy and kind of maybe a little bit jaded, quite funny. And then finally we have Loth, who is a friend of Sabran's. And when we first meet him, he's kind of going on this quest, this journey thing somewhere else. But right now the whole narrative and everyone in the book more or less is concerned about uh, this evil dragon rising and causing a lot of issues. So that's kind of where I'm at so far. Well guys, I did it. I finished it. The Priory of the Orange Tree. It took me about two weeks approximately to get through this monster but i did finish it just in time to see samantha shannon when she came to singapore last night um i'm still it felt very surreal to actually see and meet her in person but it was such a great event writing in ancient history you don't often hear women's voices um i actually read a statistic once that said that Women only occupy about 0.5% of all recorded history, despite being about 50% of the population. But this particular era, 
gives us the first novel ever written in all of history, anywhere in the world, The Tale of Genji by Lady Murasaki. And I thought that was amazing. Not only do we have the first novelist being a woman, the first named author we have in all of history is also a woman. It was my first bookish event as well, so it's a little bit extra exciting because of that. But she signed my book. Thank you. And there's actually so many people there. They only set up like 10 chairs, and I got an impression when I went to the store to actually ask them about the event that they weren't really expecting a lot of people to come but there was like a lot like it felt like a hundred people all packed into this like not huge bookstore but like the line when when people were lining up to actually talk to samantha shannon was just so 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 long um and, but when i finally got to the front of the line i was super awkward and I think I said something like very quickly, like, oh, I love your book so much. Then I asked her like, oh, how have you eaten very much Singaporean food? And she was like, yes, I did, it was super good. And then she kind of uh, confided that she can't really eat super spicy food because her eyes were watering a little bit. So that was my few moments with Samantha Shannon. Broadly, I really love this book. This is like so much fun. I think about like little girl Stephanie watching like Dragonheart and all of these other sort of dragon shows. This was the book that I needed then and, and, and that I need now. But it, it's just, there's aspects of it that are almost nostalgic for me or make me nostalgic for like some of the media that I grew up with. I think there were a few sort of pacing challenges before the one third mark. It started off very strong. And then once, like right when I was at 30%, I was expecting it to like really tick off. It was still a little slower than probably the 50 to 60%. And then things began picking up speed so rapidly. The world building is so great. It is kind of time-wise set in an analog to the 16th uh, and 17th century. And, and I really appreciate how the characters talk in a way that would be appropriate to that time period and and i think she really nailed it because she doesn't really she gives just enough of that sort of historical talk and phrasing or spellings of certain things without making it feel really dense and like you're reading maybe shakespeare that takes like it's still quite an easy text to read um but it still gives you this very strong uh, sense of time and place i don't really mind it when there are books that are kind of supposed to be set in like back then um, and they talk in a very modern way but I think that there is something to be gained from kind of embracing um, more of the historical etymology and uh, language that was used during the time that you're setting it in. It's just like a tool that she has fully utilized that I really enjoy. But the real work of this book is subverting the patriarchy and normalizing women in power, normalizing queendoms, and environments where women can be knights. And nobody really bats an eye about that because it's just part of the history and the culture of this um, this land or the lands. Aside from that, it's, it's a very classic fantasy story. There's a fairly standard quest uh, that's going on. There's sort of these people from all over and they're kind of collecting things in order to defeat the big bad. Most of the subversion that makes this story interesting is in how she explores gender norms and sexuality uh, through this text. Maybe she isn't the first person to do that in fantasy, but I do think that this is one of the best executions of it because it wasn't super in your face. It was just a world where this was part of the culture and where it's normal. So I really loved that. Now we are gonna enter into spoiler territory. So if you have not read the book or you don't want spoilers, we can say goodbye now. Bye, see you later, talk to you soon. Love ya, whatever, bye-bye. So if you're still here, I'm gonna assume that you're coming into the spoiler territory with me because everything from here on out is spoiler. So I want to begin talking about my challenge with the pacing of this book. I have two main critiques. The first is with character development, and then the second one is uh, sort of plotting. Okay, so I had to abandon the beautiful setup I had in the other place because they were doing uh, like uh, lawn maintenance or something like that that was super loud. 
But what I was basically saying is that I my challenge was with the character, specifically Lop. Like he would go all to these different places, but there weren't really any significant internal changes happening within him. So his character was very interesting to read, but he wasn't uh, really achieving or doing a whole lot internally. Or he had a bit of like internal conflict of when he was confronted with the other religion in the East and like how they interacted and experienced dragons and how even his own experience of the dragon kind of made him think, but it was really just like one or two paragraphs, like, oh, the dragons are not quite what I was anticipating and this is different from or what I was raised to believe. I think that was kind of a lost opportunity, but I just found that with a lot of the characters where the book tended to be a little bit more plot based or plot driven than internal character driven and for me I, I tend to gravitate more to like a character driven plot. That's not to say that there aren't great characters, there totally are great characters in this um, book, but I think there was just some lost opportunities for uh, more character development and growth than we actually got. Then my other sort of challenge which is a little bit related to this is that um, at the end, when I was expecting like this really big climax, I mean any climax that you're building up to it, the entire book, is going to be a little bit challenging to really uh, develop a lot of payoff, but in my mind, I would have loved to see more character inner conflict coinciding with the actual climax. But what happened in this book is I felt like they all kind of gathered together at Innes and prepared for uh, the Nameless One to rise again, where they, they fixed all of the, the problems, the internal stuff, um, except maybe for Iad and Sabran's, like, oh, where are we going to live after this? Like, what will become of us? Uh, there wasn't any real lingering questions that kind of lowered the stakes for me in that final, those final moments. But when the dragon came, it was just like, boom, bam, he's dead. And I, I think there could have been a lot more tension in the scene, and it could have felt like more of a, a, a full climax if there was a bit of interlap with the internal as well. I mean, it was still really good, it was still really well written, it was still totally engaging. Out of all of the characters that we got in this book, my favorite was like the witch, the lady of the woods, the witch of the woods. She almost felt like a Galadriel character. She was a very, she's a very classic kind of character, this enchantress that is immortal and lives um, in the woods or like away from the woods, but somehow has a history with people in the plot. Like the minute that they took the sword um, and she like took it from them, I was just like fully in. That's when it was just reading as fast as I could to the end. Um, and it really it started to work and pick up for me a lot. I also really loved Tane. I really loved that that whole plot line and I wish actually that we got a little bit more of it um, because I feel like we started there and I would have loved to have seen more of her like getting to know her dragon and that sort of like first moment. I don't normally like those uh, sequences where they're like learning how to sword fight for the first time except for this book, I kind of wish that we got a little bit more of that from Tane's perspective, but that could have been just that I really loved her. And then my main, like, other thought is that I wish we just saw Iad and Sabran get married. Like, I, I wanted that so bad. Or like, to have their their moment of being together, their, that sort of epilogue. And that was in my notes of, like, things to talk about when I was thinking about this book and, like, reflecting on it, thinking about what I wanted to talk about in the video. And then last night, uh, somebody had a question about Yad and Sabran, and Samantha Shannon said that for the last book in the series, what she really, you know, would like to do, she hasn't signed a deal for it, she's signing deals one at a time because they're such huge books, but her sort of goal or dream for the series at the end would be to kind of revisit some of these older characters, and so I kind of got an impression that we will get more of that in the future. Like, we might actually see, like, their epilogue. Because after they have gone through so much, and like, so much together and as individuals, I, and I wanted them to have, whether it was a wedding or not, like, a celebration of their journey together. But, at the same time, I really did like the way that she went about separating them and like making that 
it still it still felt okay. Like the decisions to do that felt very true to their characters as well. Um, it does make me very keen to see the follow up books and to read the sequel, even though that's not to do with the same characters at all. I just I feel like I just want more. <laughs> so. We'll see how long. I'm gonna probably take a little break before I hop right into the sequel. I'm gonna read a few like smaller books for my, my Goodreads goals because I did fall behind a little bit between packing and moving and the this book. I just need a little break, but I am really excited to continue. That's all I really got to say today, guys. I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you have read The Priory of the Orange Tree, let me know your thoughts, let me know if you have read the sequel yet or if you're going to, and uh, I'll talk to you guys soon. Bye.